MZ TV. Well, welcome. It's a lot of trouble to travel in this eon. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you all about it. Just get it out of my system, but not yet. It's even more difficult to organize these comics. So, Mark Malkus and Greg Davis, even though they live miles apart, Mark is in Virginia, Greg is up in the uh, Indianapolis area, right? Yep. And so, but you two came together. And I remember when Mark first suggested the idea of a conference in Virginia, it was in South Carolina, Columbia, and he goes, would anybody be interested in going to a conference in Virginia? A few hands went up, and then everybody looked at him like, <laughs> and then he says, well, I mean, like, I'm not going to organize it. I just want to know if anybody was interested. Well, he stepped in it, so and he delivered it. And so it's, it's not easy. It's expensive. R right off the bat, we have a couple of contribution boxes here. One is for conference. The conference expenses, that's this one here. The other one is for the books. I have books up here. The way I do it at conferences is the books are free. Take the books, especially the first idiot in heaven. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important book at this time. As you know, Paul's gospel is an ark. It's a modern day ark. Yes. The great flood coming upon the earth. We don't know when exactly, but it'll be comparable to the days of Noah. Our Lord said that, so it must be true. And in that day, the days of Noah, Noah built a literal ark. Eight people went into that ark. A boat, awkward wooden craft that stayed above the water and saved eight people. Well, in these days that are like the days of Noah, there's also another small group of people who are being saved out of the coming indignation. Paul says, Christ is our rescuer out of the coming indignation. The ark today isn't made with wood. It's not sealed with pitch. It's a message. It's a message. The message is called different things in the scripture, but I like the evangel of the grace of God. And it was given to a humble guy, a really radical guy. He wasn't too humble, come to think of it. <laughs> Saul the Pharisee. And this message was given to him. And the miracle is, and if that man were here, he would agree, that we're still talking about it. That we went to all this trouble to meet in short pump Virginia to talk about his 13 letters and the message therein. Because in that message, and it only comes through faith, faith is a gift of God, but in that message, that seals us. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that will, that is the earnest of an inheritance. And I'll speak very practically, it guarantees our extrication out of the coming indignation. And it's so difficult, maybe it wasn't so uh, difficult yesterday, but it's so difficult to look outside and picture a day when everything's going to crash, when the whole system's going to go down, and when uh, the most frightening manifestations from heaven that will make the plagues of Egypt look like Sunday school are going to visit the earth. It's just hard to believe, but like I've always said, the flood of Noah started on a Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. Everybody woke up that morning, business as usual, getting their coffee, sending the kids off to school. Our Lord said they were marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking, nothing. It's just your common everyday life. And then somebody at 2 o'clock looked up and said, huh, Seems to be getting cloudy. I don't think they knew anything about clouds back then because <laughs> the water came up from the ground. But anyway, there was a great flood. And uh, we're, we're looking down the barrel of another one. Except it's worse. It's worse. How can I say that? Because eight, approximately 8 billion people were killed in the flood of Noah. Well, they drowned. One glug of water and it's over for you. Well, this is three and a half years of torture and devastation, but that three and a half years is going to buy us, to buy the earth, a thousand years of peace. But we're not destined for the earth, ladies and gentlemen. Woohoo! Yeah. I'm happy about that. We're destined for the celestial realm. 
above the heavens that we see, above where the birds fly, above where the planets are. I've had people say to me, Martin, I look up there. No, I'm sorry, Martin. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I look up there, it's cold and dark, and I don't want to go up there, it's scary. Well, it's not, uh, it's above that. It's on heavens. There's a different word for the celestial. The word, Greek word for heavens is oranos. Celestials, epi oranos, on the heavens. There's something on top of that. It's outside the There's something on top of it. <laughs> and only one human being, one mortal human being that I know of has been there, our apostle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And he came back and wasn't allowed to talk about it. Dang it. Yeah, I wish I wish Paul had one of these. It's like, <laughs> Paul, I don't want you to say anything about this. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God, get in there. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Oh, shit. I should have got that. Sorry. Oh, Can you do it again? Can I do it again? <laughs> no. That's all right. Yes, I'll You're do it again. All this right. is Paul in the third heaven with an iPhone 13, after the <laughs> Lord tells him, do not speak or relay anything you have seen or heard. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Turns on his app. <laughs> <laughs> spectacular. Yeah. It was so great. Yesterday. I'll tell you a little bit about yesterday. Then I'll launch into my uh, talk here this morning. You see, we have a primal schedule. It's very primitive. This is theoretical. <laughs> we already started 15 minutes late, but um, I want, I'm going to be asking people, I want, it'd be better if people volunteer. If you want to give a testimony, there's people watching now all over the world. This is why we record this. If we don't record it, it's fine. We're edifying ourselves, and, it, and it's wonderful. That's why we're all here to, to be together, but people all over the world want to see this, and so we're going to make sure that happens. And people love to hear how you came to the faith. They want to hear. They've never seen your face. They want to know you. People are isolated in every corner of the earth. There's not many of us, as you know. When people come to a conference, I hosted one for 13 years in, in Willard, Ohio. They, people, well, we had one gentleman flying here from Seattle, Washington. The gentleman back here in the neon green. Seattle, Washington. I'm sure if people ask you, what, what are you going to Seattle for? Well, there's a I'm going to a Bible study. You can't find one in Seattle? <laughs> you got to fly across the United States to go to a scripture study? Well, that's right. That's right, you do. And you went to a lot of trouble, my friend, and that is to your credit. And God takes note of it. And that's it's a strange thing that um, the saints have to travel such great distances to find where they're with where this arc evangel is going out but i thank god that every one of you are here so if you i would love you to come up to me and say martin i want to i want to give a testimony i want to say how i got here people i love your story i want to hear your story you hear my story every day five days a week i want to hear you you know i'd I'd like to stop talking for a while believe it or not so uh, you can come up here for 10 minutes five minutes 15 20 at the most. After that, you get the vaudeville <laughs> cane. <laughs> Forgot the so cane. Keep, keep that in mind. So yesterday, I was scoring points <laughs> for suffering evil for the evangel <laughs> yesterday. <clears throat> because I was, uh, my flight was supposed to leave at 1, no, 2, 19, and it was about 11. I was going to lay down for a little sleep, and uh, looked at my phone and I got an email from Spirit Airlines. We're sorry to inform you that your flight is canceled. Have a nice day. <laughs> they didn't tell me why. I, I called the pirate and I said, Mark, the flight's canceled. He goes, did they tell you why? I said, no, they didn't give me any indication whatsoever. He goes, I don't understand this. This is crazy. And then he said, well, we do have tornado warnings. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, I think that might be it. I think that might be it. So Spirit said, and I emailed, go to the desk at the airport. I live five minutes from the airport and try to reset your flight, reschedule your flight. So I took my landlady, Juliana, with me because she can talk anybody into anything. She's tough. <laughs> I, I'm just in the background like, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Tell, tell them how I need to get another flight. 
There was nothing going into Richmond that day or today, nothing. I said, what about Washington, D.C., Baltimore? Get me close. No, nope, we don't fly into Washington, D.C. We, we don't fly into Baltimore. The whole eastern corridor is closed because of this incredible storm. They're really a long line of storms. And I thought, oh, no, nobody's going to be able to get to Richmond, Virginia. No, just me. <coughs> just me. I'm the only guy. It must have been, it's just the timing. It's just the timing. This thing, right when the flight was going to get here, this thing came just the perfect time. And it was meant to be, of course. This is when you rest in the sovereignty of God. So I, I had to regroup. I'm looking at the clock. It's new, and i got to get something quick. So I go back home to my computer. I'm looking at everywhere, nothing. It's like everything's boxed out. And um, I actually did book a flight to Washington. I found something, but then I couldn't find a flight to get to Richmond. I actually booked a flight at JetBlue, and then I couldn't cancel it. <laughs> because they didn't send me my ID number and they said to cancel it, you have to have your flight ID. I didn't have it, they didn't send it to me, so there's 300 bucks down the train. And then I, I booked somewhere else, I don't know what, but I thought, you know, I think I'm going to have to fly to somewhere where the storm isn't and they get in a car. So that's what I did. I, I, I was going to fly, this is just a makeshift, off the cuff plan. I'll fly to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, run a car and drive here. So that's what I did. To Charlotte, and, and, and the rental car went bad. I got to the rental car, <laughs> and our company has a so-called credit card. Not to me. It has so-called credit card, mm -hmm. but they said Enterprise, your former company, right here in Virginia. <laughs> yeah, Enterprise. You don't need a credit card. We use debit. It's great, yeah. fine. I can use a debit card. Well, you only can use your debit card if you have a return flight. They need to know your flight. Guess who didn't have a return flight? I'm lucky to get here once. <laughs> Forget about getting back. I'll figure that out later, right? I just want to get there. So I go up to the paperwork. Last minute, no, can't do it. So I'm sitting there, and I said, well, I need to use my computer to book my return flight. Where's the internet? Oh, sir, I'm sorry. We don't have internet in this building. <laughs> what? What century is this? So I was sitting there on my phone booking my return flight on Monday. I finally got the car, and then on I-85 at 7 p.m., I was somehow, some reason, doing 92 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your the roads here are so beautiful, and they're so smooth, and they're so open in the in the pat in the field in the woods. It's just and the car I was driving, zoom, zoom, you know. Yes. And I'm frustrated all day because I can't get anywhere. I'm like, finally. Da, 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 da. The reason I know I was doing 92 is because a kindly officer told me. <laughs> See those lights in the back? Anyway, that's when you rely on the sovereignty of God. So, <laughs> definitely suffering evil yesterday for the sake of the evangel. All right. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. I was starting to wonder if I was going to be here. Warning or ticket? I'm happy you're here. What did I say? What? Warning or ticket? Oh, not only a ticket, but I have to appear in court on August 15th. Oh, no. Oh. Oh. What city? Or I have to send a representative. Anybody want to represent me in court on August 15th? I would. Tell them I'm guilty as hell. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, you know. Uh, it's a sin. It was a sin, and I really feel convicted about it, honestly, because a sin is to, to miss the mark. The mark was 65 miles right. an hour. Yeah. I missed the mark. Romans 5.20 says, though, where sin increases, grace super exceeds, super abounds. But unfortunately, according to the Highway Patrol, where sin increases, the fine super abounds. <laughs> so, I don't know what the fine is. I said... Is this going to be any more than a fine? He goes, no, no, it won't be any more than a fine, but I have to be here. Well, if you had been doing 80 or less, maybe not. Anyway, I sinned. God, I'm too impatient, really. I am too impatient. Plus, I'm a South Florida driver. I mean, it's crazy, South Florida. You drive to survive. And you go with the flow. I mean, you're just driving. I never see highway patrol, ever. I haven't. I only see one in six years. I mean, they're just not out there. I don't know why. Here, they're lurking around every corner. <laughs> I didn't know that. Regina said she told me. I don't remember. Yes, she did. I was standing next to her. <laughs>
I'm still it representing you, though. It was I'm still representing you, though. <laughs> anyway, that's my story. Uh, I'm sticking with it. God is sovereign. It's just, but we, 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 we make mistakes. I do feel bad about it. But anyway, God's power for salvation. I'm going to Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 16 and 17. Uh, right at the opening strains of the book of, of Romans, Paul says what the evangel is, but it's something that's so easy to miss. I'm going to make sure you don't miss it here. So, Romans 1, starting with verse 16. And he starts at this in a strange way. He says, For not ashamed am I of the evangel, for it is God's power for salvation to everyone who is believing, to the Jew first and to the Greek as well, for in it, that is the evangel, God's righteousness is being revealed. It's being revealed out of faith, for faith. That's a strange phraseology. I'm going to explain that to you. According as it is written, now the just one by faith shall be living. All right, bookmark that. I'm going to go to Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Concerning the evangel, remember, God, Paul says the evangel is God's power for salvation. But what about the evangel? Well, in Acts 20, 24, Paul's giving his testimony in Caesarea before Festus, and he says, But of nothing have I a word, nor yet am I making my soul precious to myself, till I should be perfecting my career and the dispensation which I got from the Lord Jesus to certify the evangel of the grace of God. There it is. The evangel of the... That's the same... Literary construction, yeah, of the, as we find in Galatians 2 7, gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision, to certify the evangel of the grace of God. So the nature of it is grace. So now, with that added information, we go back to Romans 1 16. For not ashamed am I of the evangel, and I'm just going to add this, borrowing it from Acts 2 24. Not ashamed am I of the evangel of the grace of God, for it is God's power for salvation. What's God's power for salvation? Grace is God's power for salvation. Uh, the reason that's startling is you don't think of grace as power. You think of it as God being nice. Grace is God just looking the other way. Grace is, I'm going to excuse you, grace is, Christians say it all the time, but they absolutely do not understand what it is, or that it has power. The word power is here, God's power. The evangel of the grace of God is God's power. Nobody gets what I'm about to tell you. You probably already get it, and I'm sure you already know it. Is that grace has more power to change someone from the inside out than does law. And what are we contrasting all through the Greek scriptures? Law and grace. What was Paul's big issue with the circumcision? They were always trying to bring law into his message of grace. Because it's hard to trust something that you can't see. You can see the law of Moses... It was chiseled on stone. And if you broke the law of Moses, that same stone smashed against your skull and sent you to the unseen realm. So it was a tough, but it was visible. And it was doable. And it was recordable. And there were specific offerings for not doing it. So the guy would overlook that. But grace, what is it? It's it's, uh, it seems so ethereal, so wispy, so non-physical. Well, the air seems wispy, too, I mean. And yet, this air that I'm putting my hands through somehow supports 200-ton aircraft that you step into with every confidence and go down a runway at 120 miles an hour, and that this air that you can't see keeps you aloft for 
hours and hours until you arrive at your destination. That's a, kind of a miracle, isn't it? That air must have power, some kind of power. It's a substance, it's a thing. Grace has power. But in the grace message, the power is in the declaration. The power is in the unusual declaration that God is not reckoning your sins against you. And then as Romans, Paul is going to say later here in Romans 5.20, that when sin increases, grace super exceeds. The verse I mentioned earlier in relation to that. North Carolina Highway Patrol. <laughs> and the very telling of somebody, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard this. We say, well, grace is a nice message, Martin. But you can't tell it to certain people. Grace is only for good people. We can only trust good people with grace. Because if you can't tell, Martin, you can't, Martin, you can't tell a sinner that God is being gracious to him because he'll sin like crazy then. That's what you would think. And you would also think that a law that says do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that would curb offense and curb sin. Romans 5 again, law came so that sin might be, in, so the offense might be increasing. So the law, though it purports to be that very thing that will keep your flesh in check actually, if we read Romans chapter 7, causes the flesh to rebel Paul says that in Romans chapter 7, as you know law that said don't covet made me covet turns out that that law chisel and stone actually causes the heart of man to rebel but now we have a completely new thing here. That Paul is called power, and the power is grace. How's it going? Hey, bro. Hey. The power is grace. And the thing that we need to do, and I want you to think this way, is that grace, the message, the telling of it, has power to change someone's life. It's not like you're just giving them this random information. This message is TNT. They come up to you and say, God is no longer reckoning your offenses to you. I'm even saying that to Phil Meal over here. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Phil, God is no longer reckoning your offenses to you. And Phil said, you don't know what I did today. You don't know what I did yesterday. You don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. It doesn't matter. Because God looks at you as though he looks at his son, Jesus Christ. Because you were crucified with Christ. And now God is satisfied <clears throat> And now he no longer looks at the old humanity, and you're a new creature. But what if I, you're a new creature. But what if I, you're a new creature. But what if I sin more? Where sin increases, grace superabounds. Well, should I test it? No. <laughs> but you could. Oh, I had people take Romans 5.20. It's a beautiful phrase. Where sin increases, grace super exceeds. And then they get to Romans 6.1. Should we then sin more so that grace will come more? Well, in a way, that's a good question. It's a logical question. Because at least the questioner has acknowledged the fact that, yeah, where sin increases, grace super exceeds. It, it just, it's like a boat on the water. When the water rises, is the boat overwhelmed? No, it rises with the water. But this is even more. Where sin abounds, grace super abounds. So the only analogy I can think of, I think I used this once on the show three weeks ago, I, 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 I just thought of it. In God's way of doing things, as the water rises, the boat becomes an airplane. <laughs> you can't swamp it. And that is the only thing that's going to save a sinner. That declaration of grace. And yes, the flesh may take advantage of it at first. When you find out you're free and there's nothing you can do to get into God's disfavor, there's nothing you can do to knock yourself out of Aeonian life, nothing you can do. Yeah, maybe, for maybe you might do things that, wow, this is great. And maybe you might, yeah, go off the deep end a little. That's okay. You won't hear anybody in church saying that to you. <laughs> Only reason I say that 
because now you started on the right <coughs> path. Now at least you're on the right path. And you'll adjust. You'll self-adjust because of that message will be coming through, coming through your head all the time. God loves me. He's not wrecking anything to me. That guy told me, or that woman told me, that no matter what I do, God can't be mad at me because of his son taking the old humanity to the cross. Wow. That'll adjust you over time. You have to trust it. Just like when you start an exercise program, you get six-pack abs or whatever, you know, or just to lose 10 pounds, 15 pounds. It doesn't happen right away. You have to trust that the program's working. You look in the mirror, but everybody, this is what you do. I know, so I do the same thing. You work out, and you go home, and, and you look in the mirror. Why didn't that work? <laughs> Why didn't that work? After your first workout. <laughs> no. I'm going to paraphrase A. E. Nock. It's a great comment in a concordant commentary. I forget what verse he was commenting on, but he says, when people hear law, they become... They bristle at God telling them from on high that you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, well, we'll see about that. And so the flesh naturally rebels. And again, we know that. It's a fact. Personal experience and Romans chapter 7. But the person, this is what A. E. Knox says, great. The, the person who rebels against grace, well, if the person who rebels against law doesn't care. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. You can't tell me what to do. I can't even see you. You're invisible. Screw you. I'm going to do what I want to do. You must do this. You must do this. No, no, no. But the offender against grace feels it. Feels it. The offender against grace, the offender against someone who said that you can do anything you want, I love you no matter what, then you test it, and you test it, and you look up, and he's still smiling, you test it, you look up, and he's still smiling, it just like weakens you against doing it. It's a paradox. It weakens you. That love, that unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, weak, it breaks you down. And it, it takes the fun out of your sin. Did I just say that? Yeah. <laughs> Write that down. Okay. <laughs> Grace takes the fun out of sin. You can quote me on that. I don't think I've ever put those strung those words together. Ever. <laughs> because there's something in the human that likes to rebel. Romans 7. I'm not saying anything outrageous here. So before that, Paul says, I'm not ashamed am I of the evangel. Why in the world would anybody be ashamed of the evangel? Well, let's look what Paul says, a similar thing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.8. Paul says this, You may not be ashamed then of the testimony, testimony of our Lord, nor yet of me, his prisoner, but suffer evil with the evangel in accord with the power of God. There's the power of God. Again, from Romans 1. Suffer evil with the evangel, the evangel of the grace of God, which has power. Suffer evil with that. But that power gets us through. That power got me here after all the resistance <laughs> yesterday. The power of grace got me here. And the power of knowing. It's so, I don't know how anybody can survive without knowing that God is in control of Everything. Everything. That's where you rest your head after everything's after everything washes out and everything falls down and everything crumbles. If you can't rest your head on that, that makes everything make sense. I mean, you know it makes sense even though you can't see the sense as it's happening. But why would Timothy why would this Paul have to tell Timothy not be ashamed of the evangel? Or of me? Well, for one thing. Our fearless leader was in jail. Not a good look. <laughs> Even though he was innocent, they accused him of being an evildoer. He wasn't one. They accused him of being all kinds of things. He wasn't one. People accuse you because you hold this message of being all kinds of things that you're not. They accuse me of being all kinds of things that I'm not. Hey, we're in good company. We're not ashamed of the grace of God. We're not ashamed to stand on that, no matter how many people might take advantage of it, no matter how 
unpopular we are by not recommending some sort of behavioral regimen or some sort of law. So besides the fact that our leader was in jail and it was very possible, very easy to be ashamed of Paul, here's Timothy, a young kid, up and coming. Well, this truth that you have is mighty strange. Where did you get it? A guy named Paul. Oh, where is he? I'd like to talk to him. Well, <laughs> yeah. He's kind of in jail. Paul said, don't be ashamed of me or of this message. I was, at a, I was at a coffee shop two days ago preparing for this, and I, I, I had my Bible at, at, at the table. And I'm actually, I'm actually embarrassed that I, that I have my Bible. Uh, that doesn't sound good. I'll tell you why. I mean, back in the day, back in the 80s, 83, I used to, uh, the first Bible I got was a New American Standard Bible, and I'd like to carry that around at my job. I was worked at a hospital, and I'd read it during my break. I was like, oh, I'm reading the Bible. <laughs> I read the Bible. Don't you read the Bible? You know, you just kind of feel like kind of smug about it. And um, I was I was still a bit of a Christian then. I guess I was a Christian then. I was a Christian for three years before I became a believer. The difference between a Christian and a believer. You can quote me on that too. Write that down. <laughs> it's there. But the reason I was embarrassed is because now I know what Christianity is. And I'm ashamed of Christianity. And I'm ashamed that anybody seeing me read a Bible think, oh, there's a Christian. He's a goody two-shoes. If I had had a bottle of Jack Daniels at the table, I'd be. Just to show him. I'm not a Christian. Look. <laughs> I know I have my Bible, but hey, I'm a different breed. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. Oh, there's a guy with his Bible. Oh, he's squeaky clean. That's the Bible. You know, I mean, that's why I smoke on my show once in a while. And I have a drink during my during the freaking show or smoke a cigar. The reason is because I don't want somebody that I just so ashamed of the Christian religion. I don't want anybody to think that I'm one of them. And I'll do anything to distance myself from those morons and godless people and self righteous Pharisees. I'll do anything. I hate it. So I'm like, are you reading your Bible? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I'm preparing for a conference. Oh, that's cute. You teach the Bible. <laughs> So I'm actually ashamed now of the Christian religion where I was for a short time. But anyway, it's it's potentially shameful and embarrassing to herald grace because people don't like it. People hate grace, man. It's weird. You think they would love it. Wow, it's a free card. Get out of jail free card. Unless you speed on I-85. <laughs> but God doesn't hold that against me. I mean, I even apologize to God. We don't have to do this. I'm going to, set, I'm going to say this right now. You don't have to tell God you're sorry. Because you're justified. There's nothing to be sorry for, technically. There's nothing. But it's an emotional thing, and it's a thing like you just want to say it anyway. Look, you know, I don't want to be a poor representative of this evangel, you know, and I want to break the law, and I just, I'm impatient, and I want to get to where I'm wanting to go fast. And so I, I told God, you know... I'll try not to do that in the future. God says, okay, you know, it's fine. I, I, I know it's not counted against me, you know. But still, if you sin in the world's realm, you do reap what you, what you sow. But with God, you don't. You reap the opposite of what you sow. That's a good one, too. Write that down. <laughs> in God's way of doing things, you reap the opposite of what you sow. That's because the definition of grace is favor granted to those who deserve the opposite. I didn't make that definition up. Don't you still write it down? I quote you. <laughs> All right, I got more to say on this. I know I'm running. We're off schedule already, but let me just say this. Yeah, here's the thing. Verse 17 of Romans 1. For in it, the it being the evangel of the grace of God. God's righteousness is being revealed. The evangel is not about you, it's about God. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. What a liberating truth. I thought this whole book was about how I'm supposed to behave myself to be right with God. Isn't the Bible a recipe book for morality? Isn't the Bible the way that I learn how to, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to stay out of hell? What do I have to do to get to heaven? The gospel is a challenge. That's what they told us in Christianity. It's a challenge. This is the gospel. 
Here's what you have to do to earn the favor of God. But here Paul says, in the evangel, God's righteousness is being revealed. It's not about you. That's a blow to the ego when you first hear it. It's not about me. No, it's God's righteousness. God is showing how righteous he is. How? How is God showing how righteous he is through this gospel? In that, it's not just that he's being gracious to you. Okay? Something came before that. He could not be gracious to you unless he nailed the old humanity to the cross. Oh, that's it. You know, sometimes somebody says something to you and it just sticks in your head and you never forget it. And while they're saying it, you realize that this is something I have to lack. Mm -hmm. And for, for me, that was uh, Dean Huff. I've told you, I've said this before. Dean Huff, uh, editor of Unsearchable Riches magazine, we're standing in his driveway. I forget how the topic came up, but he said, talking about justification, which we do. I mean, we talk about this all the time. We're, we're going to talk about this all the time for the next two days. We're going to talk about this all, all the time. Dean said in his little ways, quiet way, well, you know, uh, God couldn't justify the old humanity. Hmm. It focused for me that God wants to just, he wants to be nice to humans. He wants to be gracious to humans, but he's also righteous, as the Christians always tell us. Well, yes, he's a gracious God, but he's also a righteous God. Okay, I'll buy that. So he can't justify the old humanity because the old humanity sucks. So what did he do? In his mind, he took the whole old humanity and put it on his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. That way, nobody could say he didn't do anything about it. Nobody could say that. So he puts the old humanity on Christ, and then, boom, in his mind, this is it, it wasn't literal, it was representational. And in God's mind, the whole old nature, the whole root of Adam, was taken in its entirety and placed on Christ in the most excruciating, horrible way, as we know, watch the passion of the Christ, and that was the old humanity going away. Now God is relieved. Now God can say, no one can accuse me of not being righteous. I did something about it talk to Christians, it's like God didn't do anything about it. Why is sin still a problem? Well, you sin, you know, we have to deal with sin. <laughs> what about that? If the crucifixion hadn't happened, yeah, maybe we can talk about sin condemning people. So the whole old humanity, now God can lavish us with grace. That's why, because he could now he says you're justified. You couldn't justify the old humanity. He couldn't, because it would be unrighteous to justify something that sucked. Mm -hmm. So he took the suckage and he put it on his son and he killed it. You can write that down, too. He killed it. <laughs> yeah, write that down. He took the suckage and put it on his son. And now, in God's mind, everything's clean now. Everything's clean. Every God takes a deep breath. Wow, now I can just, this is vacation time for God. Now I can lavish these people. And nobody can say to me now, this is God. Nobody can say to me now, how can you look at those people? How can you be nice to them? How can you tell them that they're saved by grace without words? How? I took the old humanity, their old way, and I put it on the cross. And then when you look at the cross, you go, okay, yeah, you got a point. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. You did something about it. You did something about it. And the problem is, our bodies are behind the revelation. So your bodies are still sinning. Don't worry about it. Write that down, too. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about it. Because God, this is why God can justify a new humanity. He can justify a new humanity. According to Paul, you'll never hear this in the circumcision. Never hear this from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That there is a new creation. There's a new humanity. Never hear that from those guys. Peter, James, John. Why they never got that message? Because they're still boxing against the old humanity. They're still boxing against it. They haven't got the revelation yet. And even in a thousand years, they won't get the revelation yet. We have it now. 1 Corinthians 10 11, the consummations of the eons have attained to us. And everything God is going to do at the conclusion of all the eons has come on us now in information. And information is just believing it in spite of what you see in the mirror. That's the challenge. Well, okay. Thank you for your kind attention. I saw a few people walk in. We'll get to know you. And uh, I saw that young man visiting me down there, Simon. Yeah, nice to see you. 
And uh, so let's take a little break, get some coffee, get some water. Um, like I said, if you want any of these books, take them. If you want to contribute to the books or my work, that black box, you can do it, but nobody's required to do it, obviously. So we'll be back here in, uh, I don't know, five, ten minutes. Have a nice break. <laughs>